Morning, everybody. Subcommittee on Energy is uh, will now come to order, and the chair would recognize himself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today's hearing, entitled Public-Private Partnerships for Federal Energy Management, will examine a number of recent examples, challenges, and opportunities for improving energy efficiency in federal facilities. We are primarily focused on two examples of public-private partnerships that are managed by the DOE, Energy Savings Performance Contracts, ESPCs, and Utility Energy Service Contracts, UESCs. I'd like to begin by welcoming our four witnesses. We're going to have one panel of senior reps from the Department of Energy, the Department of Army, the GSA, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Each of our witnesses will share relevant examples and lessons learned implementing ESPCs and U. ESCs at their respective agencies. The Department of Energy through the Federal Energy Management Program is the lead agency responsible for implementing rules and policies for ESPCs and UESCs. DOE collects a wide range of data and information on ESPC and UESC use across the government that's going to help us weigh the costs and benefits of these performance contracts. DOE's data is also useful to identify trends and measure outcomes related to energy and water use. I'm looking forward to the testimony from GSA veterans and the Army. Each of these agencies have well-defined programs for ESPCs and UESCs, and if you were to list the agencies that award the most contracts, these agencies would be all in the top ten. However, they each face unique challenges and opportunities depending on the facilities they are retrofitting and their specific needs. It's been over a decade since Congress amended the statute governing ESPCs and UESCs, and I think that most folks would agree that it's time to consider improvements in these programs. In recent years, agencies have used ESPCs and UESCs to gather the low-hanging fruit of energy efficiency upgrades focusing especially on lighting, insulation, and HVAC. In the years ahead, we're going to be looking for ESPCs and UESCs to continue delivering energy savings. Concepts such as deep energy retrofitting are being proposed as a facility-wide approach to energy conservation that includes new energy management systems, smart sensors, innovative technologies, and on-site power generation. We've also seen more of a focus on energy resilience with agencies utilizing ESPCs and UESCs to harden their grid and install backup power generation. For example, with the help of performance contracts, Fort Knox recently became the first military installation with the capability to unplug entirely from the grid. Utilizing demand management, on-site natural gas, geothermal, and renewable energy resources. Good work. In order to stay on the cutting edge, Congress may need to consider changes to the statute to enable agencies to capture the cost savings offered through the most innovative energy conservation tools. And given the time that's passed since its original drafting, we ought to start by looking at the definition of a federal building and the definition of energy savings. We ought to also consider how energy efficiency upgrades affect the life cycle costs of operations and maintenance at the facility and ways to harmonize the program with other successful programs and goals. These issues and several other changes to performing contracting authorities are addressed in legislation that has already been reported by the committee, H.R. 723, the Energy Savings through Public-Private Partnership Act of 2017. I look forward to working with the bill sponsor, Mr. Kinzinger on his legislation, and as we run out of time in this Congress, as we know the clock is ticking, I hope that we can continue to work on this bipartisan bill early next year. With that, I want to again thank the witnesses for appearing today, and I yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, my friend, uh, Mr. Rush. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this markup. Today, examining public-private partnerships for federal energy management. Mr. Chairman, like members on both sides of the aisle, I fully support the objective of both the Energy Savings Performance Contracts, or ESPCs, and the Utility Energy Savings Contract, UESCs. However, we must also take heed to the warning 
by both the GAO and the CRS that a lack of consistency in reporting across agencies for projects makes it challenging to document the actual savings achieved solely from ESPCs or UESCs. Mr. Chairman, ESPCs and UESCs allow the federal government, the, national, the nation's largest energy consumer, to leverage public-private partnerships in order to improve energy efficiency and save taxpayer dollars, uh, while also increasing the use of renewable energy in the nearly half a million facilities uh, that uh, the federal government uh, maintains and supports. ESPCs and UESCs consist of contracts between a federal agency and another third party, either an energy service company or a utility to finance options uh, that employ private sector resources and capabilities in order to facilitate the investment of energy efficiency and renewable energy at federal facilities. Through ESPCs, private contractors finance the upfront costs of, energy, of efficiency updates, which may include modifications such as transformer upgrades, the installation of high efficiency lighting, rainwater harvesting equipment, or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning improvements. The contractor assumes the risk of the energy improvements and certifies that the upgrades will generate savings that, cost the, that cover the initial cost and the agency pays a yearly amount for a fixed period of time. Under the ESPC program, the Department of Energy has awarded 400 projects, invested $6 billion in energy improvements, and, search, and, and saved an estimated $14 billion in cumulative energy costs since the year 1998. Mr. Chairman, in regards to USCs, US ECs rather, more than 1,800 projects have been reported with 3.3 million leverage, uh, 3.3 million dollars leverage through utility partnerships since the year 2000. ESPCs are headed by the Department of Energy's Federal Energy Management Program, which also provides training, guidance, and technical assi assistance to help federal agencies achieve their energy and water uh, conservation objectives. Based on FEMP data, ESPCs funded $5.7 billion, and UESCs funded $1.5 million, million in energy efficiency improvements between the year 2005 and 2017. Mr. Chairman, the data suggests that there's been an overall trend of declining uh, energy and water use and an increase in renewable energy consumption as a share of the overall energy usage due to these programs. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to our witnesses today, and I want to thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. It's my understanding that uh, Chairman... Walden is not going to be able to make it for an opening statement. Would anyone want his time on our side? Seeing none, the chair would recognize Mr. Welch, who's going to take Mr. Pallone's time for five minutes. Uh, thank statement. you very much. Uh, you know, there's two ways that we can deal with the $150 billion uh, backlog in repairs and energy efficiency uh, set, uh, improvements that need to be made. One is we can appropriate taxpayer dollars uh, and make that investment. Uh, in the other is we can enter into these energy saving performance contracts and utility performance contracts and not have to put up front uh, taxpayer dollars. Uh, there's a good argument to invest taxpayer dollars, but uh, there's not the votes to accomplish that. 
On the other hand, if we enter into these contracts with the private sector uh, where they provide the financing, they do the work, and then they get repaid from the energy savings, then everybody is a winner. And this energy efficiency is really a big deal. Uh, in addition to cutting down on uh, the cost of energy, every single improvement is made by a local laborer. This is real work that it goes into the communities. Uh, that has to create jobs. I've been working with Mr. McKinley on this for, for some time. So you get taxpayer savings, you get local employment, and oh, by the way, you reduce carbon emissions. So it, it's tremendous that we're working together on this uh, with such bipartisan support, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and we'll be doing that next year as well. So this is, this is a big deal. Mr. Rush cited what the uh, amount of money was that we saved, and we want to keep that up. There's some questions that are coming up about the audits. Uh, GSA, by and large, has been very positive about what's there. But you know what? We should audit, and let's keep auditing because that information can help us make improvements, make it more efficient, and maintain uh, support within Congress for what has been a very solid program. So bring the audits on. We'll make the improvements. We'll make the adjustments. Uh, it's been great to work uh, with Representatives Kinzinger and Moulton and Blackburn, uh, who are the co-chairs with me of the House Performance Contracting Caucus. This is an area where instead of arguing about uh, the science of climate change, uh, we can talk about the benefits of saving taxpayer dollars and creating local jobs and employment. And I think there's a huge number of our uh, committee members who want uh, to find a way to make this better, stronger uh, uh, for all, uh, all involved. And I want to thank uh, the chairman and the ranking member for this hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. At this point, we're prepared uh, to uh, hear from our witnesses your statements. Thanks for submitting them in advance. Uh, they'll be made part of their, the record in their entirety, and we'll, we'll ask each of you to summarize those in, in no more than five minutes, at which point we'll obviously go to, to questions. Uh, uh, for all of you. Our first witness is Leslie Nichols, the Strategic Director of the Federal Energy Management Program, De Department of Energy. Welcome again. Good morning, Chairman Upton and Ranking Member Rush and members of the Energy Subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on performance contracting. My name is Leslie Nichols and I am the Strategic Director of the Department of Energy's Federal Energy Management Program known throughout the federal government as FEMP. In my capacity as strategic director, I am responsible for analyzing, evaluating, and making recommendations to EERE leadership on the effectiveness of FEMP programs. Today, I will provide a brief summary of FEMP's mission and activities, the impact of performance contracting, and FEMP's perspective regarding current performance contracting opportunities and challenges. FEMP's mission is to provide strategic energy management tools and resources to enable federal agency mission assurance. In a nutshell, FEMP assists agencies' agility and ability to become resilient, efficient, and secure. FEMP supports Executive Order 13834 by providing guidance, resources focused on optimizing energy and environmental performance, reducing waste, and cutting costs. FEMP enables federal agencies to reduce their $16.1 billion energy bill and meet energy and water management goals by providing support and accountability for federal agencies. We continue to increase the skills of a multidisciplinary federal workforce by providing training and best practices. FEMP provides technical assistance and guidance for completing energy savings projects by leveraging private uh, sector financing through the use of performance contracting. Performance contracting has had a significant impact uh, on the improved energy performance of the federal government over the last 20 years. FEMP estimates that government-wide over 600 ESPC projects and over 2,000 USC projects have been implemented, resulting in energy infrastructure improvements of $12.5 billion with a value of cumulative energy cost savings over the life of these projects of $27.5 billion. Since 1998, FEMP has offered its own contracting vehicle, the DOE Indefinite Delivery Indefinite Quantity Contract, known as the IDIQ. The current IDIQ has 21 energy service company awardees, 
36 agencies have utilized the IDIQ contract in 50 states, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and have invested about $63 billion in federal energy efficiency and renewable energy improvements from 1998 to 2018. Fiscal year 2018 has been a record year for the IDIQ awards. Federal agencies using the IDIQ contract provide $809 million of facility infrastructure investment, which will result in 2 trillion BTU of energy savings annually, which is the equivalent of the energy use of 25,000 average U.S. households. Going forward, we know there is an opportunity, a potential for continued use of performance contracting, including improving infrastructure by addressing the estimated $150 billion of deferred maintenance and repairs related to aid agency facilities and equipment. Another area is supporting facility-wide resilience as efficiency underpins resilience. FEMP is developing a systematic, prioritized approach to resilience portfolio planning that helps agencies identify mission risk, prioritize projects, and identify financing options. FEMP is continuing to work with performance contracting community to identify barriers and gaps associated with the use of performance contracting for facility-wide resilience. Through training and outreach, we are working to address inconsistent interpretations of legislation and guidance, which inhibits accounting for operation and maintenance savings within performance contracts and leveraging <coughs> appropriations and incentives with project financing. We are also encouraging agencies to consider all ECMs in performance contracting, including advanced building controls, microgrids, and distributed energy resources. Bundling these some less <coughs> cost-effective ECMs with more cost-effective ECMs is a key to this approach. To summarize, we believe performance contract tools, when applied wisely, will continue to be a useful tool for future to assist agencies in their efforts to become resilient, efficient, and secure. FEMP will continue to identify ways to improve its program tools and guidance for performance contracting. And as part of this process, FEMP will continue to analyze the data received from performance contracting reporting, life of contract support, and quality assurance functions. I appreciate the opportunity to address you this morning. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. And the next witness is Jack Sirosh, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy and Sustainability at the Department of the Army. Morning, Welcome, sir. sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, Chairman Upton, uh, Ranking Member Rush, uh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify about Army energy resilience and our utilization of energy savings performance contracts and utility energy service contracts. The Army appreciates your interest in this area and the authorities which support Army readiness modernization and reform. Secure uninterrupted access to energy is essential to sustaining critical Army missions and how our installations support operational warfighters and enable Army readiness. The, Army, the Army's 156 installations located around the world must be ready, secure, and capable of deploying and sustaining forces. As potential vulnerabilities emerge in the nation's utility distribution infrastructure, Ensuring reliable sources of energy for our installations has become increasingly challenging. To meet these challenges, the Army is pivoting energy planning and assessment approaches to increase the focus on resilience. The Army leverages private sector expertise through energy savings performance contracts, or ESPCs, and utility energy service contracts, um, or UESCs. These projects enhance resilience, improve efficiency, and help address maintenance backlogs and repair or replace aging and failing equipment. The Army has the largest ESPC program in the federal government. Contract costs are paid from commodity and operations cost savings and are therefore budget neutral. We have awarded over $2.2 billion of ESPCs since 1996 and over $674 million of UESCs since 1992. ESPCs and UESCs are an important tool at Army installations as we work to achieve energy resilience across our installations. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this testimony and for your continued support of our soldiers, civilians, and families. Thank you. Uh, our third witness is Kevin Kemp Shore, 
Chief Sustaining Officer and Director of the Office of Federal High Performance Buildings, uh, GSA. Welcome. I think you need to turn the button on your mic. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Rush, and members of this subcommittee. My name is Kevin Kampscher, and I'm the U.S. General Services Administration's Director for the Office of Federal High Performance Buildings, as well as GSA's Chief Sustainability Officer. I appreciate being invited here today to testify on GSA's policy and experience in using public-private partnerships to achieve energy savings for our federal buildings. I will also discuss our National Deep Energy Retrofit Program and share with you several lessons learned. GSA's mission is to deliver value and savings in real estate, acquisition, technology, and other mission support services across the government. GSA manages over 371 million square feet of space, housing 1.1 million federal employees from 65 different federal agencies. Executive Order 13834 reinforces the Trump administration's commitment to meeting energy and environmental statutory requirements in a manner that increases efficiency, optimizes performance, and eliminates unnecessary use of resources. Reducing federal buildings' energy consumption and increasing their efficiency saves the government money and makes our buildings more resilient in the long term. GSA has been using these types of partnerships since 1989. GSA has invested over $1 billion in both ESPCs and UESCs, resulting in an annual energy savings of 4 trillion BTUs in GSA facilities and $2.3 billion in guaranteed savings. A key benefit of the ESPC is the guaranteed performance and savings with no upfront capital costs. ESPCs have been proven to work. In fact, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory showed that the actual savings to the federal government were 1.96 times the guaranteed savings. Given that the repair and alteration funding is often in short supply and federal agencies have repair backlogs estimated government-wide to be over $150 billion, the ESPC is an important tool for maintaining a deteriorating infrastructure. In addition, a power purchase agreement can be used to purchase electricity from specific generation sources. For civilian agencies, these agreements are limited by statute to a term of 10 years. GSA has executed power purchase agreements for ourselves and for other agencies, such as an aggregated set of solar systems in Washington, D.C., with a total capacity of 2.7 megawatts and cost savings of $281,000 annually. An integral part to achieving these efficiencies for GSA is the Deep Energy Retrofit Program. A Deep Energy Retrofit is a whole building analysis and construction process that uses integrated design to achieve larger energy savings than conventional retrofits. GSA has awarded 32 contracts in this way at 73 locations, totaling $570 million in investment with $33 million in annual savings. These contracts have provided overall energy savings of 34 percent on average, which is nearly double the historic average for the government. For smaller projects, GSA partnered with the Department of Energy, the Federal Energy Management Program, to create the ESPC-enabled program, which uses an existing GSA schedule contract and couples it with pre-planned, streamlined ways to accomplish simple improvements. This program has been used by 12 agencies in addition to GSA for projects saving $83 million with an investment of $55 million. I'd like to share with this subcommittee three lessons we have learned among the many. We have found it important to aggregate short and long-term measures to maximize synergy and build long-term value. For example, an investment in window replacement does not typically pay back in under 25 years. However, when you couple the window replacement with chiller and heating plant improvements, the windows may reduce the overall load in the building, reducing the size of the chiller and saving money in a way not possible without the ending window replacement. Secondly, centralizing ESPC contracting reduces the time for project execution and increases savings. During our first round of the Deep Energy Retrofit Program, we reduced the time to award from two years to one year, significantly reducing contract overhead costs and then applying those savings to building improvements. Lastly, not every project is suitable for an ESPC and it's important to carefully select buildings using well-developed analytical tools and criteria. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Public-private partnerships are valuable tools agencies can leverage to increase building efficiencies and save money while not relying on annual appropriations. GSA has seen significant cost savings and we are continuously pushing for greater savings in our future contracts. I am pleased to be here today and I'm happy to an answer any questions you may have. Uh, last witness is Ed Bradley, Executive Director of the Office of Asset Enterprise Management at the Veterans Administration. Thanks for your service. Yes. 
Thank you, Chairman Upman and Ranking Member Rush and members of the committee for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the Department of Veterans Affairs, VA, Energy Management Program and allowing us to highlight the success VA has had upgrading our facilities through Energy Savings Performance Contracts, or ESPCs, and Utilities Energy Service Contracts, or UESCs. VA operates the nation's largest integrated health care system, as well as administering benefits and services to veterans and operating 135 national cemeteries. The average age of a VA-owned building is approaching 60 years, and since VA owns 86% of the 180 million square foot real property portfolio, ensuring VA infrastructure continues to support VA's mission is a constant challenge. As identified through VA's Strategic Capital Investment Planning Process, better known as SCIP, VA has more than 50 billion in capital needs over the next 10 years to modernize and maintain its infrastructure. Along with the appropriated projects, VA has been using ESPCs and UESEs to address its infrastructure needs. Since its first award in 2011, VA's centralized program has awarded over $630 million of ESPCs and UESCs. These projects are supporting infrastructure upgrades at 60 VA facilities using private sector financing to implement energy and water conservation measures. Once installed, these improvements are expected to generate over $40 million annually of avoided energy and water cost which translates into more than one billion of, afford, of avoided cost over the life of this portfolio of contracts through 2040. By leveraging the benefit of private sector financing, VA facilities are able to efficiently address chemical, critical system repairs, infrastructure improvements, and deferred maintenance. These projects are also allowing VA to enhance the resiliency and reliability of our facilities, enabling better care for veterans. In addition to the awarded portfolio, VA is actively developing another $550 million of potential upgrades for 35 other VA facilities, and an additional 15 facilities are being looked at in initiating projects to support their needs and as well as others in the future will be looked at. VA centralized energy performance program has had many successes since its launch and several VA projects have received national recognition for innovation and value. For example, VA's UESC in Northport, New York addressed a critical infrastructure repair when the facility's rooftop cooling towers failed. VA coordinated with the Department of Defense Innovative Readiness Training Program for Helicopter Services to support replacing the cooling towers as part of the UESC. A video of that cooling tower replacement has been predominantly fe featured on DOE's uh, website. VA's program continues to evolve. In June 2017, VA issued the federal government's first ESPC vehicle to solicit as a set-aside for eligible veteran-owned small businesses. VA is actively developing several of these set-aside ESBCs and is in the process of establishing its own IDIQ contract to allow veteran-owned small businesses to more efficiently compete for these projects. Energy performance contracts have proven to be a very effective tool for VA and we hope to continue to expand and improve upon their uses in support of our mission of care for veterans. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, this concludes my statement. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before this committee today, and I will be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Well, thank you, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you all for your, your testimony. Well, at this point, we'll go into questions and answers uh, uh, from all of us here. Ms. Nichols, 
as you know, the uh, performance contracts have been around since the 1990s. Uh, we amended it in 2007, and we've got Mr. Kinzinger's bill that before us, but it's likely to, to be pushed off in, into next year. Would, what, what do you think the greatest challenges are, uh, and what, what do we need to do as we look <coughs> to m make further improvements uh, down the road? In, in terms of uh, challenges, uh, clear and consistent understanding of legislative interpretations uh, is something that FEMP has been working on to clarify with agencies. There is inconsistency across federal agencies uh, of the legislative authorities uh, with the use of ESPCs and UESCs and consistent application of FEMP guidance. Uh, two examples would be the use and the ability to leverage appropriations with project financing for resilient projects uh, and also to be able to take advantage of incentives with uh, uh, performance contracting. So as, as I mentioned privately to you as, as I walked in the door, I, I learned uh, just this morning that uh, the Assistant Secretary Winberg is actually at Fort Custer today, which is adjacent to my district. It's a National Guard base. It's one of the finalists. Uh, President Obama agreed that we needed a, another missile defense site uh, for North America, uh, for the for the west side of the of the country, and or the east side rather. And uh, this is one of the finalists in that. I've been to the site a good number of times. Uh, one of the things that's uh, really been pretty exciting is that Consumers Energy uh, Company has actually installed a pretty major solar grid uh, there, and uh, that is one of the performance reviews in, in terms of the decision making by the Pentagon to decide you know, which, which potential site is going to get this award that was approved under uh, President Obama. Uh, as, as I said, Secretary Winberg is there today. Uh, as I represent that area, and, and you know, this will be a $3 billion project if, if it gets uh, end, end up there. Uh, but this is this is one of the real strengths I think that Fort Custer has. Uh, I just want to. I, I know you don't know much about it. Uh, at least I don't think so uh, this morning. But I just would like to work with you as as we move forward. As it appears as though it's a it's a major incentive, which is why they're unveiling this uh, today. And uh, I don't know, uh, um, uh, Mr. Srash, if if you know much about it as well, but. Uh, again, if, if we could work with you and if you have ideas on how we can make this better, um, we, I'd certainly appreciate it. We would, uh, the Federal Energy Management Program would be pleased to work uh, with you to, uh, on this project and uh, we look forward to following up with you um, at a later date. Uh, sir, um, I don't have uh, uh, details at my fingertips, but Army will be happy to, uh, to follow up with you and, and provide you information that, that, uh, that we have available. Great. Uh, yield Mr. Rush for five minutes. Thank you. I want to <coughs> again thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Madam Nichols, uh, is there a centralized list of contractors that DOE maintains, and how does a contractor uh, get on a list if it, if it, if there is one? Uh, how does the contract try to get on it? Also, I, I understand that there is a set aside for veteran contractors at the uh, VA. Does uh, DOE or any other agency also maintain a list of minority contractors? And do we know uh, the percentage of these federal contractors, contracts rather, that were awarded to minorities? In terms of the maintaining a list of qualified energy service com companies, yes, the Federal Energy Management uh, Program maintains the qualified list of ESCOs. There is a process that is outlined uh, in our resource materials as we vet energy service companies, not only those that are part of the IDIQ, but also those that are part of our NABEL program uh, so, yes, we have that, that list. In terms of set aside for uh, veteran owned minority companies, there are small business, uh, there is a small business, and uh, the current enable includes two disabled veteran 
um, ESCOs. Uh, I will have to get back to you on the percentage of minority owned businesses, ESCOs, um, that are currently on our qualified list. Right. Uh, under an ESPC, how does the private contractor finance the upfront cost for energy upgrades? Does the money come from uh, financial institutions, banks, or the, are the companies themselves uh, responsible for doing the work and also funding the, uh, the cost of doing the work? Typically, uh, an ESCO will work with a financing company to obtain finance for the project. The project goes through rigorous uh, price reasonableness evaluation as well as viability to obtain that financing from a third party. Mm -hmm. And um, Mr. Bradley, I think, uh, are there, do you maintain any data on <coughs> minority veterans uh, and their uh, 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 the number of minority veterans that have uh, contracts under this program, under, under FIP? Uh, what we are doing is identifying the veteran-owned small businesses that uh, have supposedly energy-type uh, capabilities. We are working with DOE to get those businesses qualified and certified. Even with those small businesses, they sometimes have a, a lacking in overall financing capabilities. And through SBA and the uh, small business uh, set-asides and so forth, they are able to joint venture with some of the bigger businesses that can handle with financing as well. So the two are working together on joint mm -hmm. ventures bringing in the S, uh, VOSBs as well. I, I just want to make a note, Mr. Chairman, that you know we are moving into an era where diversity in government contracting really means something. You know, if we're not just, this is not just a, um, some kind of a political uh, comment, uh, uh, slogan. It really means something. And so we would, uh, I'd like to meet with you, uh, Director Nichols, to really kind of flesh this out more and see whether or not uh, what exists and how it can be enhanced. Maybe you're doing a great job, I don't know. But you don't know either, and that's my problem. Thank you, and you're back. I, I would be happy to follow up with you, sir. Um, uh, as an additional note, uh, FEMP does provide um, a robust training, uh, both for ESCOs and agencies including small business and small disadvantaged businesses. Thank you. Great. Ms. Charleston, Vice Chair of the Subcommittee in Texas. I thank the Chair and welcome and happy holidays to our five experts. Um, as you all may know, I grew up about a mile and a half from the Johnson Space Center, the home of American human space flight. This is in my heart. It's very important to me that the work being done there continues even when a hurricane hits like Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey hit Texas hard in August 25th of 2017. The Johnson Space Center has a mission that has to keep going throughout a hurricane. International Space Station has been in orbit now for 20 straight years with a human being on board every single day of that period. They can't go down when a hurricane hits like Harvey and they didn't go down. They shut down the center on the 25th when the hurricane hit, opened the center on the 4th of September when it was clear, but guess what stayed open the entire time? Mission control at JSC, controlling our space station. And now Ms. Nichols, you guys had a big role in that at DOE. It's called the Effect Grant. Gave one to JSC in 2014. They leveraged that, let's see, it was a one billion dollar effect grant that supported a 47 billion dollar investment in new combined heat and power projects. So please take a victory lap. 
and tell us about the project at JSC, what it accomplished, what it can accomplish. Can it be a model for other NASA centers and also any other federal government agencies? It's a great project. Thank you, sir. The NASA Johnson Space Center project can certainly be a model for other federal agencies as a case study and as a way uh, to accomplish a great deal. Some of these accomplishments include uh, the fact that, John, as you mentioned, uh, Johnson Space Center with the help of FEMP technical assistance and through the use of our AFFECT, which is assisting federal fa uh, facilities with energy conservation technologies program through the use of our Federal Energy Efficiency Fund Authority, was able to provide $47 million investment. The AFFECT program provided the $1 million investment, uh, so there was a good leverage there. The project uh, had a new combined heat and power uh, capable of providing the site with 70% of its base power consumption, allowing the site to operate off the grid during outages, as you mentioned. That it, it has 12, a 12 megawatt CHP plant. It allows Johnson Space Center to operate in island mode. It also helped uh, NASA meet energy intensity reduction goals through 2020. Interagency collaboration was uh, a piece of this as well to create replicable resilience projects. Other ECMs include boiler and chiller improvements. Uh, it was a $47 million project with a 22-year term, and it, as you mentioned, is located in Houston, Texas. And uh, just to reiterate for our members here, she mentioned $1 million of federal money became $47 million in private investment one to 47 million. And uh, you have to put your Texas hat on, ma'am, and brag like Texans brag. That's amazing, 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 thank you. Final question for all the panelists, just based a big, uh, big high level question. Just to understand the range of issues you have to deal with. It's real simple. What have been the lowest hanging fruit to deal with that's been achievable? What's the highest? What's the thing you have to do, want to do, but it's gonna cost a lot of money or some technology changes? Uh, how about start with the VA there? Michael DeBakey. Uh, the lowest hanging fruit would be lighting, things like that. The highest would be uh, chiller, boiler replacements, HVAC replacements. Uh, using the two together to combine is where you get the cost effectiveness that you can do both. Thank you. Mr. Capshore. I would say in addition to lighting, uh, control systems are the very good uh, uh, very fast payback. Uh, the most difficult uh, things we've had to deal with is roof replacement uh, with increased insulation. doesn't pay back, but again, coupling it in a uh, deep energy retrofit where we've been able to do that, and uh, there's nothing like having a non-leaky roof over your head. keeps your investment dry. And hurricanes make for leaky, leaky roofs. Mr. Shirash. Sir, with respect to low-hanging fruit, um, uh, I would agree lighting and uh, a, a range of, of basic um, efficiency uh, improvements. Um, these days with the Army, with our, our pivot to focus on resilience, uh, you know, we're looking for projects that help us withstand, uh, you know, interruptions in electricity and water and services such as that. So those, we're finding those projects as, as uh, you know, uh, very um, challenging uh, um, uh, to pursue. Um, but but we're making progress there. Thank you, and Ms. Nichols, one more chance to brag. I agree with my esteemed colleagues that the low-hanging fruit is uh, lighting and basic H HVAC upgrades. Uh, I believe that uh, the opportunities for uh, big projects are the fence-to-fence -fence, uh, projects that enhance resilience, uh, include microgrids and advanced building technologies, and present the opportunity to leverage your appropriations with performance contracting because not all resilience measures um, do pay for themselves in a performance contracting situation. Thank you very much. Time's over. Mr. Yep. Sarsh member, go Navy, beat Army. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Next year. Uh, Mr. McNerney. Well, thank you, uh, the chairman, and it's too late uh, to, to, for Navy to beat Army this year, I'm afraid. Um, so. It sounds like all of you are, are think that these are favorable, uh, the uh, ESPCs and the UESCs. Could each of you verify that with a simple yes or no? You think these are good uh, ideas and you'd like to see this continue starting with Ms. Nichols? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Well, good. Um, how about this question uh, with the same format? Uh, U.S. Uh, PCs and UESCs need significant or could use significant improvement by legislation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. Um, Ms. Nichols, are the incentives appropriate to identify uh, and use ESPCs and UESCs as quickly as possible? I, I believe that there are good incentives out there. Um, there's always room for improvement. Um, Okay. Um, Mr. Bradley, uh, where did the VA end up with regards to the 2014 goal of $2 billion in ESPCs that were part of the Climate Action Plan? Uh, we, we achieved that goal. Uh, it was successful. It's on. It took some time to get there, but we did achieve that goal. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Sirsch, uh, are any projects of your agency working on to implement, are they hindered, uh, and is there something Congress can do about it? Uh, sir, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any, any projects um, that are hindered. There's certainly some room um, um, to, to bring forward some uh, enhancements uh, to the legislation, um, as the Chairman uh, noted at his op okay. uh, during his opening comments. Very good. Again, Ms. Nichols, uh, I understand that many agencies use the DOE's umbrella IDIQ, which is indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracting vehicle. Uh, what more can be done to modernize our federal buildings aside that tool? Be besides the IDIQ? Right. Um, there is the, the use of also of UESCs and working with your utilities and taking, care, uh, taking advantage of, uh, of incentives. There's the use of uh, power purchase agreements, again, uh, partnering with your utility uh, to have on-site renewable generation. And there's also uh, lo really looking at resilience portfolio planning to look at your infrastructure against your risk and prioritize those projects uh, so you're prioritizing those with the highest level infrastructure needs. Thanks, that's a good list, I appreciate that. Um, are the uh, FEMP's uh, guidelines designed to ensure that UESCs provide energy savings uh, adequate or are they designed to, to be yes. adequate? <coughs> Very good. Uh, Mr. Suresh, uh, what benefits have ESPCs and UESCs provided the DOD in its efforts to enhance reliability and resiliency? Uh, uh <coughs> we're very happy with, the, with what we're seeing, sir. So, so first of all, uh, we get uh, the best ideas from, from from the energy industry uh, brought into Army installations, uh, um, you know, r really, really great ideas and, and, and great projects. And also, as you're aware, the ESPCs and UESCs <coughs> allow these projects uh, to be completed with no upfront capital. We, of course, pay for the pay, pay back uh, that investment through through a saving stream. So that really helps us leverage the amount of work that we're able to perform. Thank you. Now, something closer to my district, Mr. Bradley. I've been working on uh, with the VA to build a clinic in my district, um, and you spoke about how the average age of buildings is 60 years old in the agency's portfolio. Uh, what is the VA doing about new construction regarding uh, resilience and efficiency? The, the answer to that is that <coughs> VA regarding resiliency, that's <coughs> a common practice that we incorporate into all of our projects being the fact that we are essentially first responders in emergency situations with medical care and so forth. So everything we do has resiliency and reliability built into it today. Do the ESPCs and UESCs have any relevance in new building construction? In new building construction, no. It's m more into the renovation of existing structures, things like that that we have incorporated ESPCs. We have not dwelled into trying to incorporate them into a, a new uh, facility construction project. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Latta. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for our panel for joining us this morning. Uh, Mr. Shirosh, if I could uh, ask a few questions uh, from your testimony. How long do, do you have to do an analysis before they implement these uh, projects at the installations? 
Um, sir, it, it depends on the complexity of the energy and water conservation measures. Um, um, it, it, I would say a round number would be maybe six to 12 months, but, but we find end to end that we're typically able to, to uh, get these projects in place quicker, quite frankly, than if we had direct funding. So, so we're very pleased with, with being able to do that. Okay. You know, looking at your testimony on uh, page four, five when you're talking about the, uh, is it pronounced the Toby Hanna? Uh, Army Depot in Pennsylvania with, with the award there of uh, $29.5 million for the ESPC and then uh, saves the uh, Army about 3.7 annually. Again, on a, uh, on a base like that or a, uh, or a depot like that, what th what's the average payback time then for you all? Sir, that, that really depends on, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the complexity of the project for uh, relatively straightforward, simple projects, a, a payback uh, could be in, in three, four, five years. Um, th this is a, a more complex project. Um, I don't have the number I can follow up uh, and give okay. you the exact number on, on the payback, but this is a more complex project, so I would expect it to be maybe in the higher teens or maybe up towards 20 years possibly. And when you're looking at, uh, you're looking at these um, ESPCs, uh, do, do you also do that uh, with overseas bases? Uh, yes, sir, we do at, at, uh, at uh, certain um, locations where we're ab able to do, to do them. There's country-to-country uh, -country agreements and things like that that we have to pay attention to, but there are some, there, that we do s some third-party uh, ESPC efforts at, at Army overseas installations. And uh, if you can answer it, do you, do you find that uh, when you're doing them overseas it might be quicker or that you might get a faster payback on some of these? I think it's uh, uh, similar to what we're finding uh, within the continental United States. Uh, uh, the, the ESPC uh, contracting uh, approach is, is I, I think we find fairly, uh, it's a fairly rapid thing. Uh, you can always get uh, involved in, uh, it's an, you have to negotiate, you could, you could end up eating up a lot of time if, if the negotiations don't speed along, but I, I think, in a, in a, I think typo, typically end to end we're seeing seeing these done fairly rapidly. We're, we're very, we're, we're, we're happy with what we're seeing. Good. Uh, Mr. Kempshaw, if I could uh, ask uh, from your testimony, could you get in more, a little more uh, information on when you talk about the deep energy retrofits uh, and uh, because you're, you're talking about how that you're doing instead of a, uh, the retrofit of a whole building analysis and construction project it uses integrated to achieve a much larger energy savings than the conventional energy retrofits. And how that works then? Yes, sir. I, I think the uh, an example is probably the best way to do it. Uh, right here uh, in suburban Washington, New Carrollton, we did a retrofit uh, uh, that's a 1.2 million square foot building. Building was built in 1994. Uh, at the time we started the retrofit, the um, energy consumption was 26 percent above the um, office average for the United States, and afterwards it's 61 percent below. We achieved 62 percent overall energy savings. It's been in operation for four years, and we've measured the savings every year, and they have uh, achieved them. We replaced uh, the central chilled water plant with a smaller <coughs> plant because we improved the insulation of the building and the roofs. Uh, we have integrated uh, controls and sensors. We have 11,000 individually addressable LED light fixtures within the building that can respond to different uh, levels of energy use. Um, we have uh, one megawatt of on-site renewable energy, uh, and we also uh, Im improved it by uh, adding a geothermal field to um, uh, use the, uh, the heat recovery of the earth uh, there. Um, we created 550 local jobs during the course of that construction. And, uh, and also improve the operation of the uh, IRS data center there as well, reducing their internal costs. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thanks to the witnesses for coming today. Um, I appreciate the advanc advancements that have been made uh, on energy efficiency and government infrastructure. And bef before serving on this committee, I spent two terms um, on the House Armed Services Committee where we had similar discussions with respect to the military. And the military is often ahead of other parts of the federal government in testing and using new efficiency technologies. Uh, in San Diego, which is my home, uh, we launched the Great Green Fleet with ships burning uh, cleaner fuels. We tested and implemented smart grids with solar power investments at 
uh, at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. Uh, we have just north of me at Pendleton taking advantage of microgrid technology. Uh, and we've implemented new energy savings um, in local federal buildings. And I'd like to see this progress continue, not just with the military, but with all our federal agencies. And it, it occurred to me, uh, and I addressed this to um, Mr. Suresh and Mr. Kempstrower, uh, that I would I'd be curious about how we coordinate with uh, across agencies. So in the military, for instance, um, Mr. Suresh, is there a way for all the military bases in a region to join together for one long-term power agreement with a local utility? Um, or on a broader scale, if all federal infrastructure uh, in a region banded together in a power purchase agreement, do you think that there's ways to do that? Are there barriers to, to you doing that? Um, first within the military, Mr. Suresh, and then I guess Mr. Camp Shore across the across the federal government, um, sir. Um, w with respect to, to purchasing our utilities, we're dealing with uh, first of all uh, regulated and deregulated uh, uh, um, uh, uh, regions. Uh, but it, it, it appears, uh, uh, from, from my knowledge, that that um, that each service is buying uh, utilities at at the base level, although. There, there have been some efforts with the Defense Logistics Agency Energy to, to bundle uh, purchases together. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I believe that Army, Navy, and possibly Air Force in for deregulated uh, places that are served by, uh, uh, that have deregulated service, uh, we, we have that. But for the most part, in, in, in places where, where the utilities, it's a, it's a regulated utility, I, I believe it's, mm -hmm. we're purchasing, uh, each base is purchasing um, uh, by themselves. Now, certainly, I think this is a great idea, and it's, uh, it's something that, that we should explore to, to to use our buying power as the as the federal government, not just the Department of Defense, but other agencies also. Mr. Mr. Kamstrow. Yes, sir. I think there are no real impediments uh, for us to do that. GSA has uh, the uh, government's energy purchasing authority um, uh, for all agencies. We have purchased uh, energy on behalf of virtually every other agency in the federal government uh, upon occasion. Um, as my colleague from the Army has stated, in the case of the deregulated uh, uh, utilities, uh, there's much more opportunity for looking at um, uh, bundling requirements, uh, for uh, sort of structuring the procurement so that uh, all your eggs are not in one basket, you have different s sources. Um, and I think the, the potential is certainly there. Maybe, Ms. Nichols, I could ask you to, um, there's no one here from the Army Corps, but maybe you're the one most knowledgeable about the dams that the federal government works on. Uh, it strikes me that those could, could be powered up uh, for hydropower through uh, power purchase agreements would make, would make a lot of sense. Um, are you familiar with how far the government's uh, come on doing that, that sort of work uh, with, with dams, uh, hydropower? There certainly is an opportunity with regard to hydro uh, power and performance contracting. However, currently there is a lack of clarity with regard to the use of performance contracting uh, and the ability to use performance contracting on hydro facilities. There are some agencies uh, such as the Army with Mr. Sharash that have been able to use uh, performance contracting with hydro facilities. Uh, but it is not a consistent wide practice across the federal government. Okay, is that something that needs a legislative attention? It definitely uh, would need clarity. Uh, there is not clarity whether a, a thou shalt or a thou shalt not. Uh, okay. So again, that goes back to my opening statement that this is one of the areas where there's inconsistent interpretation of the legislation. Well, I hope we can work on that in the next Congress. I think it, sh it should be thou should. Um, if those are opportunities to provide um, uh, some really clean energy to the uh, that's base load power, and I think would be um, we could we could take advantage of that. So I'll look forward to that in the next Congress, and I yield back. Mr. McKinley, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is something that when I had my engineering architectural practice, this was one of our specialties uh, was the energy efficiency and, and performance contracts. So I have quite a familiarity with this, uh, but I'm curious now. Um, uh, Cato has come out recently had said that there are some 360,000 federal buildings across the country or maybe around the world, uh, especially because of the military. And um, um, if, if this hue and cry coming from some of the new members of, about making our buildings all energy efficient, uh, state of the art, you know, within 10 years, 
I'm just curious about the fiscal challenges that that's going to pose to all of us. So if we could start, Mr. Ash, uh, you with the, the Army, you're the, the Army has the, the majority of the buildings, uh, uh, of federal buildings. Do you have a projection at all of what that cost um, might be to, to bring all your buildings up uh, uh, to state-of-the-art highest efficiency uh, within 10 years? Do you have an idea what that might cost? Um, sir, I, I don't, but I can attempt to provide that in follow-up. Uh, I, I mean, the, uh, the, the Army has many facilities. Um, uh, due to other priorities, we're not always able to devote, frankly, the resources. Well, that's, that's that we the should. second part is where I was going to go with the Army is that if we're going to put all this into energy efficiency, and I, listen, I'm a very strong supporter of that, but what effect does that have on our national security and our preparedness? Uh, um, so I, I'd like to see that how that contrast could be with that. Do you have, do you have within the Army um, um, a, a cost-benefit ratio that you try to consider before you do a project? Uh, we're uh, very focused on lowest life cycle costs, sir. So um, uh, we would be willing to spend an extra dollar up front um, when we're uh, when, when we're doing something to save a thousand dollars over its life cycle, I, I can assure you that our any of our new projects or major um, upgrades or modernizations, we are providing uh, very um, efficient. We're, we're meeting uh, statute requirements and regulations. Okay. So, so, so and that's all being done. Go to uh, Camp Shore um, with the uh, GSA. How about the same thing? Uh, uh, do you have a, an idea, of projection, an estimate of what it might cost to? to bring our buildings to energy efficiency within the uh, state of the art within the next 10 years. Do you have an idea what that might cost? I do not have that idea today, and I would be happy to uh, do a little research and get back to you on, on if that. If you could, let me just, it, well, I've got your attention. Uh, is, do any of it, is that a reasonable goal that we should set aside <coughs> our other, uh, we've got modernization, upgrades, other things we have to do to our buildings. Uh, uh, is this the right thing to do? To, to make our buildings energy efficient within 10 years? I think that is a goal that the Congress could set, and we would do our damnedest to uh, achieve it. But I would, yeah, I hear you say that. That's a good political answer, but I'm curious about what the cost would that be and how we how we do that. Same thing with the VA. Um, um, how, how much do you think it's going to cost? If, if, you had a, if you had a timetable of 10 years to make Every VA facility across this country, state of the art, highly efficient. What, what do you think that might cost? We we have no metrics on that cost, but we do know that within our portfolio, over the next ten years, we have roughly fifty billion dollars worth of upgrades and improvements that need to be done to VA's infrastructure and facilities. A portion of that cost would be energy efficiency, okay. water conservation, and so okay, forth. That's, that's what percentage? No idea. Can you get back to? I'd like to. I'd like to start building a file on this of what the cost could be for the VA, for GSA, uh, and for our military. Maybe we just focus on the, the Army, and then the, of course the Department of Energy. So I'll, just closing is, uh, you you you're following the same thing I am about what the, some of the proponents of this Green New Deal. Uh, is it reasonable from the for each of the four of you? Is it is it reasonable to expect that we can achieve these things within ten years? Mr. Ash. Yes or no? Mr. Ash. Yes. Uh, sir, we would try. I could not commit it. Mm -hmm. I, I would have to do a little okay. bit more work on this. I think it's a reasonable goal, sir. It is a reasonable. I think it is a goal reasonable. I'm not sure, based upon the other needs of VA and so forth, we are building energy efficiency and energy conservation into all of our projects, so we're getting a lot of that through that. Okay. But the overall goal, it would, I would like to be reasonable, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Yield back. Mr. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Rush for holding this hearing today and after following my, I'm glad to follow my colleague from West Virginia. Federal injury management uh, is an issue that we've been trying to address for years, having programs that permit, promote energy efficiency, conserve water and reduce emissions should be part of federal building management. The energy efficiency improves, improvements are often 
difficult to obtain due to budget constraints and competing agency missions. I'm glad that we're taking the time today to look at what we're doing right or see where improvements can be made. Under current law, often referred to as Section 433, bans the use of all fossil fuel generated energy in federal buildings by the year 2030. It's been 11 years since this law passed, and not only are we not on schedule to meet the 2030 target, but we are not on schedule to meet the 80 percent reduction in 2020, just two years away. Neither the Obama administration or the Trump administration have created regulations to implement the law. I don't believe these goals are achievable as such, and I introduced legislation along with my colleague on our committee, Congressman uh, Buddy Carter, to replace these provisions with a series of energy efficiency measures that can be implemented today. Uh, my questions are, does the administration believe that Section 433 is implementable? I just go down the list if you know what the administration stance on is. Uh, I I do not know where the administration uh, stands on a particularly 433 executive order 13834 does promote uh, the use of cost cutting and waste reduction through energy efficient upgrades to promote resilience and looks at an all of a, above strategy. Um, for energy. Okay. Uh, sir, um, I'm not familiar with, with exactly where we stand, but, but the direction the Army is going in is we are laser focused on resilience. We're, there's a lot of threats out there that we're very worried about. And at the same time, we're interested in efficiency and the lowest life cycle cost as we move forward. But is it true, though, that uh, um, we're not going to meet the 80 percent in two years, much less 100 percent in I'm sorry, I don't have those details at my fingertips. I'll provide that as a follow-up. Okay, thank you. Any other response? I'm just concerned because uh, Fort Hood in Central Texas is not in my area. I'm, I mean, Houston uh, is probably the biggest uh, Army base, I, I think, and just uh, trying to put investment in that would take a, a significant amount. Um, do any of you believe a focus on energy efficiency would be better target to aim for in uh, for than a complete fossil fuel ban, just uh, to have steps to take over a period of years instead of saying we're going to do this. Uh, I'm sure if I if I can just quickly address Fort Hood, uh, the Army has a, uh, a a project down there where where half of the electricity uh, is being provided by a a wind farm. It's actually a, it's a couple hundred miles away. And, and the other half we're buying from from the local utility, and and and, and we've got a, a real uh, a real good deal there. We're very, we're very happy with that. Yeah. Any other that question? Well, I have to admit, uh, coming from Texas, uh, and this uh, energy subcommittee has done a lot of hearings on on what's happening with, and oftentimes 40 percent of our base load is from windmills, whether it be from West Texas or South Texas, and uh, and other. Uh, and, and since natural gas is so cheap, it's easy to turn on a burner and turn on a, uh, to receive it. Uh, can you elaborate on how energy savings performance contracts or ESPCs are a valuable tool toward meeting the efficiency goals? Yes, sir. Mr. Green, I uh, thank you for the question. Given the uh, amount of uh, repair and alteration requests, which we all mentioned, and the lack of uh, ability to fund all of that, ESPCs and UESCs and energy conservation are a key component to being able to uh, achieve energy conservation, but also to improve the deteriorating infrastructure of the federal government. And I think, uh, as Mr. Bradley pointed out, uh, not every uh, item on our list of deferred maintenance is an energy item. So there's never going to be, uh, under the current statutes, uh, the ability to do all of the repair and alteration backlog with energy savings performance contracts. However, they can be a key component and should be. Okay. I know I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, but um, maybe the committee could look at that and say, uh, you know, instead of this hard 100% uh, uh, use, we could actually see progress over the next few years and because the electricity market and energy market are, are changing literally every day. So, and thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I start my questions, I'd just like to say to Mr. Green, I know uh, you're not going to be coming back next session. Uh, best of luck to you. It's been a pleasure serving with you on our, Thank you. On our uh, committees. Appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Bradley, for you, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran of uh, nearly 27 years myself, and I know that the work that uh, the Veterans Affairs Department does is extremely important. I, I would think that the health and comfort of our nation's uh, heroes is first and foremost in the minds of, uh, of executives when they're making management decisions, including changes in your energy management plan. Can you tell us a bit more how our veterans are considered uh, their health and welfare when making energy management decisions? They, they are considered in the way that we put together our various projects and so forth, the impact on the care and the services that we provide to veterans. That is one reason that every energy conservation major measure that we see, we look at the impact on the operations, we look at the impact on the veterans of being able to serve the veterans, decide strategically what is the priority as far as what needs to go now, what needs to go later, the impact on care. We look at all that before we decide which ones we go to. Okay. And then we set up a site development plan that we work with the various ESCOs to achieve. And you got multiple sets of eyes that's looking at all that. Yes, sir, from okay. up and down the VA. Okay. H how does addressing resiliency and reliability of our energy delivery systems impact how uh, the VA cares for our veterans? And, and how can the VA further improve those efforts? From the resiliency standpoint, VA is a 24-7 operation. We have within all of our uh, designs, our implementation of projects, our implementations of retrofits, resiliency built in, resiliency and reliability. With being a 24-7 uh, operation, we're there to serve the veteran at that time. So we got to make sure everything is up and running, the equipment's running, the operating rooms are conditioned properly, the sanitary is there, things such as that. This is something that we, we constantly build in. Okay. Uh, Ms. Nichols, in, uh, in your testimony, you discuss how uh, uh, the Federal Energy Management Program will continue to refine practices relating to measurement and verification. Can you discuss some of the challenges in that current work, and do you believe there's a role that Congress will need to play? In terms of what we're doing, uh, we uh, continually uh, work with uh, agencies and ESCOs to ensure that MNV is happening, and then we analyze the MNV reports to ensure that the savings are being retained. Um, we constantly want to improve the accountability and transparency around MNB. Uh, there are challenges that MNB is not necessarily consistently applied uh, and utilized throughout the federal government. So training and providing training of full contracting teams, both those technical energy managers and contracting officers, uh, would be something we'd like to see continue. Uh, as well as uh, clarity, again, uh, for <coughs> the need to use uh, Federal Energy Management Program guidelines around performance contracting. Okay. Are, are there other issues that the Federal Energy Management Program is looking at or, or plan to more closely examine after it gets done with its uh, measurement and verification work? We continue uh, to do our life of contract support and quality assurance where we are looking uh, to make sure uh, through the use of data collection and e-project builder that we have sound viable projects and case studies throughout the federal government uh, and also looking again at clear and consistent understanding of legislation interpretations 
uh, for these bigger complex projects such as resilience, leveraging appropriations <coughs> with performance <coughs> contracting. Okay, right on time. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Mr. Doyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shirash, battery storage paired with renewables or any other type of energy production can lead to energy efficiency and resiliency for microgrids and isolated military bases. Uh, is the Army taking steps to utilize this technology, and, and how does the Army determine which technologies are preferable for a given project? Um, thank you, sir. Yes, we're, we're interested in, 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 in all the above. Uh, first of all, uh, our view is we are currently technology agnostic, so uh, we are looking for what the, what the, uh, uh, the market could bring. Now, our focus is resilience. But, that, 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 but that's very complementary to the, the legacy uh, focus uh, on efficiency mm. and conservation and, 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 uh, and, of course, lower costs. Um, I, I, I can just give you a quick example. I'm out, it happens to be out in California. Uh, we're using an enhanced-use lease, so this is a deal where a third party is going to come in and, and generate power and, and actually sell it to the market, and we're only going to want it during a contingency or when the grid goes down. That's a uh, active procurement uh, right now, and it and it appears that the uh, the, the proposer is going to bring bring in in the case out there. It's going to be uh, PV with a very large uh, battery storage and a microgrid and a little bit of a either natural gas or diesel um, 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 generator to, to to ensure that we have a 24/7 uh, availability of power. Thank you, uh, Mr. Campshore. You speak about opportunities that uh, deep energy retrofits present. Are there challenges uh, to deployment, and how? Are you trying to address those challenges? In any large uh, uh, and complex construction contract, of course, there are challenges, and we do uh, look at that. Uh, one of the principal ways we're doing that is uh, by having a very consistent uh, contracting support centralized uh, so we can get not only uh, the best experienced contracting officers, but uh, also consistent legal interpretations that we use nationwide. Secondly, uh, as uh, with the Army, we're looking for a um, somewhat an agnostic uh, approach to what is pro uh, proposed, uh, but what we've found is that uh, working in partnership with the, um, with the companies, we get a much better uh, result than just keeping everything hands, uh, hands, hands off. So we use our engineers, we use their engineers, and we work together with the building manager to see all of the things that can be done in the building and push for the deep energy retrofit. And uh, I mentioned things like leaking roofs. We've been able to put that in there. We've been able to incorporate, for example, in, in San Diego, battery storage that enables us to take uh, 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 advantage of the demand response systems there, which saves money. And it's not just energy, but money that we're also uh, focused on savings. And then consistent management uh, over time of the contract. I, I meant to ask you too. Uh, I know you noted that there's a backlog, a repair backlog of 150 billion dollars. It's not all, all energy. But I'm just curious. How does GSA assess and prioritize projects to address the backlog? Is there a methodology to that? What you do first? Yes, there is. We have uh, a, uh, a an organization that ha consists of portfolio and asset managers that looks uh, every year at a, a five-year uh, forward look at all of the uh, repair requirements, uh, sets priorities based on a, a series of criteria uh, that we develop and modify every year. Looks at you know how long do we uh, intend to be in the building, what's the condition of the building. Uh, what's the uh, uh, urgency of the mission? What are the needs of the agencies? Uh, it, it's important for GSA also to look at it not just from the pure real estate point of view, but also the point of view that we only exist to serve the mission needs of the other agencies. So we're looking very closely with the agencies that we serve as to what their needs are, and we prioritize them uh, accordingly. And we go through that uh, set of priorities using uh, some fairly modern uh, systems for analyzing them in order to come up with our budget request every year. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I will yield my time to my good friend from the Bluegrass State, Mr. Guthrie. <laughs> Thanks. You didn't tell me ahead of time you are going to do that, so I appreciate that very much. 
I know, I'm, I'm waved on. So You've been I'm, asking me all day to do it, and you didn't know I was going to do it. I appreciate it very much, and, and I'm on the full committee, but not on the subcommittee. I wanted to come because Mr. Sharash, you and I participated in an exercise at Fort Knox, which is in my district, and uh, it's a, Fort Knox is obviously a key component of the Army's function with Human Resources Command, First Theater, theater Sustainment, trains most of our, our officers. And uh, we experienced in Kentucky the 2009 ice storm. So we're talking about resilience and, and being down. Things were down all the way across Kentucky and affected Fort Knox. And, and of course, Kentucky's blessed in many ways. Um, one is that we have a lot of natural gas. So we were able, so Fort Knox is able to go off the grid and be resilient. We were there to experience uh, that exercise when they showed they could go off the grid. And while Fort Knox is a unique because of Kentucky's abundance of natural gas, can you speak in general how the Army has taken full advantage of natural resource production on bases across the country to support energy resilience and Army readiness? Yes, sir. Uh, Congressman, it was great to, great to be down at, at Fort Knox with you in, in late October uh, to witness that, that very successful exercise. Um, so, so uh, and, and thank you for your assistance with uh, Section 320 of the National Defense Authorization Act to, to, uh, uh, to remedy things uh, down there with respect to the Army's uh, drilling for natural gas. So th this is something we're very interested in, and it's because of resilience. That is our focus. So, so we're interested in working with, uh, uh, with the Congress and the Department of Interior and the Department of Defense to, to see where, where uh, it would make sense um, to, to do something similar to what we have at Fort Knox, where we essentially are able to uh, produce our own natural gas and, and, and provide uh, you know, power and heating and cooling. Um, in a very, uh, it's very efficient, uh, it's very low cost, but it's very, very secure and, and probably uh, at the top of our list would be the uh, McAllister Army Ammunition Plant um, out in Oklahoma. There are a couple other um, installations also that, that we're very interested in, but we're actively working this, this issue right now. Okay, thank you. And, and I know, as you've talked resilience several times, uh, when the Army looks at installations, they specifically emphasize the ability to continue operations off the grid. And I know Fort Knox has done that. Do you, so that's a big plus for Fort Knox that they're able to be off the grid. I'm not every base has that, op that ability to do so. Uh, Congressman, that, that, that's right, um, and, and actually the, the current Army policy is focused on uh, facilities that support critical missions and what we would, we would like them to have a minimum of 14 days ability uh, to continue to operate. So, so in, in, in my lane, that's energy and, and water sorts of considerations, and, and Fort Knox, you know, you know, absolutely has that with respect to, to energy and, and water. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and I appreciate that. And those are the questions I have about it before I yield back to Mr. Long, just to answer Mr. Uh, Olson earlier. So, M Mr. Rush, you were a career Navy officer, but you now work for the Army, so Ar go Army, beat Navy, right? <laughs> uh, Congressman, sometimes I, I seem to say uh, go Army, go Navy, and I seem to get away with it. Okay, that sounds good. Well, I noticed your boss was on the field. Cop here. out, cop uh, I'll out. Yield, I'll yield back to Mr. Long. Well, thank you. I didn't know you were going to yield back to me. Mr. Bradley, in your testimony, you highlight the success that the VA has, has seen in reducing its energy costs through energy savings performance contracts and utility energy service contracts with a savings of over $230 million since 2008. How has centralizing the management of the ESPCs and UESECs <laughs> through the VA energy management program helped the VA maximize energy savings, and is this something that could be replicated across other agencies? The way we have done that is that we have centralized the procurement of the ESPCs and UESCs with a central contracting arm in uh, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. By doing that, we have the expertise together of doing ESPCs and so forth in conjunction with our field energy managers that are identifying the ECMs and things like that. And with the centralization, everyone understands how the contracts are set up, how they're put together, how they're negotiated, how you're going through the investment grade audits, things like that. When you decentralize it to individual contracting people in the field, they may be doing one UESC or ESPC in their lifetime. These guys are working it every day, and that's how we get the efficiency of what we are doing. And is that something you think could be replicated throughout other agencies? It 
it certainly could be, yes. I'm not sure what the other agencies, contracting arms, how they're set up, but it could be replicated, and we've promoted that quite a bit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank all the uh, panel for the good work you're doing. Really appreciate it. Uh, President uh, Trump's uh, 2018 Executive Order 13834, it said some of the really good things about needing to improve federal energy and water efficiency. Uh, it didn't provide details or metrics. And my view, no details, no metrics, no progress. And the question I have for really all of you is, is whether uh, energy efficiency has been less of a priority since the new executive order uh, was released. Has there been a drop-off in a new performance contract project starts? Maybe I'll start uh, with you, Mr. Campshore. For GSA, uh, energy efficiency and improving building uh, operations has remained a high priority. It has not diminished. Um, we awarded a large number of contracts, uh, and there is a kind of a cyclical process for identifying and uh, bringing forward new contracts, but we have continued the program, continued the centralized uh, program for uh, energy efficiency, and we continue to uh, work on improving the um, operations of, of buildings even uh, without energy performance contracts through better use of the uh, existing funding streams that we have and uh, prioritizing the uh, operations of buildings. Mr. Bradley? We essentially have not sh uh, slowed down. Basically, we are doing 25% uh, of our facilities a year looking at energy conservation measures through audits, and with that, we're putting together ESBCs, UESCs, because we see this as a way to use non-appropriated dollars that essentially we can use in other places to get the energy efficiency, to get the water efficiency, and in concert with that, get some upgrades as we go through. Let me ask you, thanks, and I'll ask you a different question, Mr. Shuras. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, the, the longer, the, the deeper retrofits have a longer payback, and that's tougher uh, sometimes to make the numbers work as quickly as you want. Uh, and how much uh, does y your agency rely on performance contract to deal with these deferred maintenance issues where you're trying to get a longer, uh, a longer payback but actually longer term savings as well? Um, uh, sir, we, we have a, uh, we're doing a lot. We're, as, 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 uh, as my statement uh, mentions, we're the, the largest user of, uh, of these third party um, right. uh, public private venture uh, agreements in the federal government. Now we happen to also have the largest amount of, of infrastructure. Um, so it's, we find it very complementary to the direct funding uh, we're able to receive. Um, we're, 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 you know, it really helps us with efficiency, but we hope to use these deals to help us uh, strength and resilience at our installations uh, as okay. we go forward. So you're moving ahead. A absolutely. Uh, Ms. Nichols, uh, you know, at the federal level, uh, we heard from all of you, but there's a big opportunity uh, to get the same benefit in municipal buildings, state buildings, state facilities, schools, hospitals. Uh, and as you know, the states often lack the resources, uh, including it's kind of the infrastructure of people like you uh, who've got some experience on how you make it work. And the question I have is how can we, do you have some practice, practical suggestions on how we can encourage more of this work at the state level? And do you see any opportunity for Congress to partner with states uh, in a way that we could help provide technical assistance uh, in training where it's warranted? Yes. Uh, I do see opportunities to facilitate performance contracting at the, s at the state and at the local government level. Uh, FEMP has uh, partnered with uh, the uh, WIP program within EERE to uh, help facilitate the training of best practices for performance contracting. Uh, last year, we, uh, in last August, we had a, our large uh, training event that also included uh, state and local governments where we went through best practices for performance contracting. In addition, uh, our training uh, is open and 
our tools are um, agency agnostic, that we try to defederalize our tools and resources. Uh, many agencies are members of communities, so there's synergy that we can learn from each other. Um, and so any help uh, that uh, to help us bolster our ability to provide training and provide our resources both to the federal and state level would probably be helpful. Okay, thank you very much. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. I would just uh, note that uh, we had a very good attendance today, but we've got other subcommittees that are meeting. We may have some questions that may pop up by other members that uh, were not able to come, but we really appreciate your your testimony, your thoughts, your answers, and look forward to working with my new chairman, Mr. Rush, uh, next year to continue to, to make sure that this is a priority and appreciate all the work that you do. And with that, subcommittee uh, stands adjourned.